Yeah? yeah? Right? Yes. Deal? Boing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. module for that there of course there is that's on YouTube or live now we are live on the internet now I am jam from Acquia and this is the video extension of the Acquia podcast the Acquia podcast is a forum in which I talk with people every week about Drupal and open source community technology and business today I have with me Rick DeBoer from Australia, Ryan Cross, normally from Australia, but right now on the west coast of the United States, Susan Rust, and Carl Shirer. These four are the crew that makes up Top Shelf Modules. I'm Susan Rust. Um, I've been in Drupal since 4.7. I've had a Drupal shop. I've done enterprise level consulting. Most people know me from Drupal Anywhere, um, where we actually did a lot of client wrangling and help small shops grow uh, from 5 to 20 or 30 to 50, whatever they needed to do. And it was a lot of the work in Drupal for a very long period of time that um, I'm a very lightweight site builder, but a actually relatively good um, project coordinator, solutions architect. And one of the things that I noticed as a business owner was how much time we spent trying to get modules to work. And over the period from 4.7 to uh, 7 and now going into 8, I'm watching um, an interesting decline and we felt that it was time to do something about it. And this is what I do full time. Who's next? Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm Carl. I've been in Drupal for six and a half years now. Uh, pretty much as a developer and architect. I started with Achieve Internet. Uh, I worked for Acquia, I worked for Qualcomm, Drupal Anywhere, and now uh, I'm with Top Shelf Modules. And our focus, I like to say we're making Contrib better. And since everybody uses Contrib, I find that most people think this is pretty useful. That's good. So I'm Ryan Cross. Um, I've been in Drupal now for over eight years. Um, started actually um, doing some site builds for a university. Um, and started up the community user group in Sydney, Australia. Um, during that process, I've also been working uh, and built up uh, Cross-Functional, which is a Drupal shop, um, doing development, integration, e-commerce. Um, and I'm still working there, but at the same point, I'm seeing a lot of the same problems that, um, that Susan has mentioned, and so that's why I wanted to be part of this. And I'm uh, Rick DeBoer. Um, I run a uh, small Drupal shop called Flink Collective in Melbourne, Australia. I got in touch with Drupal about five years ago um, during a Java project. I used to be a Java and C++ uh, developer and team lead, uh, but fell in love with Drupal. I haven't looked back since. I do uh, Drupal and Drupal only now, and I'm particularly passionate about uh, the Contrib space and D8, and it's through that channel that I met the, the guys on the other ki uh, side of the pond. Um, so, um, yeah, we've got three or four people very uh, passionate about um, the contrib case. I would like to start by asking you, Susan, to expand a little bit more on what is Top Shelf Modules? So Top Shelf Modules is a has two points to it. The first is the funding platform where very similar to Drupal Fund Us or Git Tip, we're trying to get some revenue flowing into Contrib. Contrib maintainers um, find it very difficult to make a living during Contrib. And as our projects in Drupal are scaling, we can't uh, rely on having an entire ecosystem built on catch as catch can. And a lot of people genuinely love writing modules. Like that's that would be their preferred choice. And we'd like to see it actually be its own viable form of Drupal profession. So that's the funding part where we're trying to generate recognition for high quality work. The second part that we do is curation. And the curation means that um, as 
when core is being built, there's a lot of checks and balances and process, and there's a roadmap for what a good feature in, in core looks like. And what we want to see is actually that some of those same mechanisms um, overlaid onto Contrib so that there are higher standards of interoperability, of usability, of documentation. And so we have currently 30 modules under review, or 36 modules under review. Yeah, so we want to curate them, set standards and guidelines, and get modules into really top shape so that there's not so much regressive building in Drupal where we think it's the norm to come to Drupal modules, fix patch and um, wrestle them to the ground, and spend a good part of our project dollars doing regressive work rather than saying all our modules, which are professional tools, should work off the shelf pretty well and robustly. And so the second part of what we do is the curation and we like to think of ourselves as kind of going towards the underwriter's laboratory model, model for modules. The, the number one misconception we get at top shelf modules is people think we're going to make like a marketplace and we're going to start selling modules, we're going to go Joomla or WordPress route. And I find that it's very important that people know everything goes on Drupal.org. All of our code is contributed. Nobody has to pay for anything. We use the Drupal infrastructure that's available. Um, and so we, we keep everything as open as possible. How, do, how would you like to fund this on an ongoing basis? You know, it's a classic problem, and we've been talking about it for years and years. We've had reverse bounties. We've had the thought experiments that Robert Douglas introduced a couple years ago around the idea of an app store to get that conversation going. How do you envisage module quality as a business? Well, you know, that's interesting. Um, I think we spend a lot of time thinking about our model. And it's very important to stay what I call Drupal compatible, that we, we use the same ideals and ethics that are in Drupal. Um, but that makes it very hard to run a traditional company where you are selling products or you own something that nobody else has. Um, so that's how we started. So we basically have the concept of we have to be good stewards. We have to be good stewards and recognize that if I'm making a living using Contrib modules, I have to share that money downstream with the people who built them. And so it's a simple logical connection, but I think the challenge has been that the funding just doesn't come from that. So our main source of revenue right now is actually asking the Drupal shops for sponsorship. And there are enough Drupal shops and enough Drupal professionals that we can afford to pay um, a team of two to three to four people um, over time to work on module curation. Because it is important. And I think a lot of... Um, a lot of shops may not actually be tracking that line item in their development, and I would challenge them to start doing it. So yes, you have what you call your development project hour bucket, but look at how much of that time is really spent chasing, hunting, researching, vetting, patching modules, and, and what if that could get diminished by 80%? Like how much would you save? And not. Or even 10 or 20 percent. Yeah, even 20 percent. Um, We're starting low. But, but, you know, if, if you talk to the engineers, this isn't meaningful work, like patching little things. That's not why we're in Drupal, to, to do, fix potholes. We want to build skyscrapers. Well, and, and they're often surprises. Like, you, the module claims to work. It has worked for other people in the past. So you decide that you're going to use it on your site, and then you discover your particular use case or your set of modules doesn't quite work the way you want. So it's an additional, easily, two, four, eight hours could be more. And we want to reduce that number. Particularly around performance, that's, that's where a lot of like, larger enterprise projects are, are struggling, is they, you know, they're estimated based off of the fact that a module actually is there and exists. But once they actually enable it, it kind of falls apart underneath any kind of you know stress or or usability requirements that a, that an enterprise customer is going to have. Um, so I, I think the other thing that we probably need to highlight as well is um, sponsorship is is definitely one of the main things we're doing right now. But we're also trying to make this something that individual maintainers can actually get a direct revenue stream 
through donating uh, donations from other people. So we're trying to use the concept of buy somebody a beer and support their work, um, and that makes sure that um, uh, that a lot of money can actually go directly to the maintainers for the work that they're doing. And the reason I don't think the marketplace ideas have taken off is anytime you're a company, you're an established company that's going to launch that, it's hard to have two points of focus where you are professional services and you build sites, but then you also run this marketplace really well. And then it also becomes a bit of a fiefdom. Like that's now your marketplace and people are reluctant to participate because they know that's actually generating revenue for you or enhancing your business. So I like the top shelf modules is independent. Uh, we don't do client work. Uh, we don't do uh, we don't steal your clients or do your projects. But we can play with everyone. Um, we can be friends and we can help out wherever we're needed. And you know the marketplace is and those ideas are saying let's come up with a new a new way of selling Drupal. And we're saying we already have the products. The products are all, all there. All twenty four thousand modules are products today. We just need to come up with a way to make those rewarding. Okay, I think this is a great point to step back to the technical side of this. Mm -hmm. When you're, how do you go about uh, selecting? <clears throat> how do you go about selecting the batches of modules that you are going to work on now and in the future? And what are the sorts of not only the selection criteria, but you were talking about roadmap, you're talking about performance. What are the factors that you're looking at to fix? And what kind of concepts of unification, centralization, how does a, the roadmap concept that you mentioned uh, apply to the contrib module space? That's a really simple question, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll start off. Um, Initially, uh, well, you asked how Rick became involved. Rick was our first uh, maintainer to join up. And the reason we wanted to talk to him specifically was that he does an awesome job maintaining his modules. If you look at his issue queues, they are clean. He has responded to everybody. All his projects have releases. Like, you can tell that this is a maintainer who really cares about the people using his modules. Um, and so we, we wanted maintainers that are good so we can focus on giving them the money rather than um, telling them what they're doing wrong or how to do it, do better. Um, so that was a great experience. And then our initial focus was on modules that have single maintainership, um, which is a little unusual in Drupal land. But we did that for uh, ease of ease of handling the the billing and the money. Um, we'd like to. We're going to get to the point pretty soon where we can handle multiple maintainers and figure out how to pay that out. Uh, but initially, we thought let's just keep it simple. Let's look for high usage modules that have a single maintainer who obviously then uh, wrote all the code. And uh, let's ask, let's invite them. So we talked to a lot of maintainers, and that's how we got most of our initial ones. And now it's spreading more through word of mouth, and people have actually heard of us when we go to events, which is really nice. I guess just to address your question, Jam, about the technical stuff that we're actually reviewing. Um, obviously, one of the biggest things we're looking at is how well the, the Drupal modules actually meet uh, Drupal's coding standards. Um, we're looking for best practices. We're looking for security issues that would be in, in modules that may not have been looked at, um, as well as some of the underlying pieces like um, API documentation as well as end-user documentation, um, looking at usability for, for sites or for particular modules um, and how they work with um, site uh, builders. We're also looking at accessibility. Um, and then several other factors as well, um, which you can find out some more details on the website. Topshopmodules.com, and there's a section in there called Required. Yeah. Required Standards, and um, that is actually a very long acronym for some of the, the hopes. And even just things like we, we want our maintainers to be quick in the issue queues. We want them to have print releases. We want them to manage the entire thing called this is an awesome module. And when we get there, like we will live up to the greatness that is coming in Drupal 8. I've already built my first tiny Drupal 8 website. And it's, it's an incredible leap from Drupal 7. And it's going to be wonderful for the adoption rate of Drupal. And our contrib modules cannot fall down in the face of that, which right now they're kind of heading towards a little bit of a crash, right? Mm -hmm. So Drupal 6 modules, uh, probably, <laughs> yeah, probably a B plus uh, in terms of user experience. They were small but robust. 
They did what they said they were going to do. They didn't break each other. Drupal 7 got dicier, bigger, more complex modules, um, and everything got a little wobbly. And in Drupal 8, um, we don't know. But we are going to take a firm stand on Drupal 8. We're going to be right in the mix there. Um, we just finished our first workshop at Bedcamp on porting modules to Drupal 8. So we're excited. As of, as of Monday, November 4th, 2013, what is the state of Contrib? And how, you know, if I have a, a module that I maintain, how realistic is it to start my module upgrades now in the contrib space? Well, I, I've got a few things to say on that, if I, if I may. Well, yeah, you say, Rick, you just heard a blog post about that. It's probably an idea. Um, yeah, so I, I've, I've written a few blog posts uh, on, on this topic. and. Uh, the state of contrib in D8 uh, at this stage is not very good. Um, less than 4% of all these seven modules um, have been ported to D8. Uh, a lot of people say, well, but it's not time yet because uh, D8 core beta is not out yet, so why would I bother? And my approach is that um, you should bother as soon as possible. Uh, there's a lot to learn in D8. Um, so to take it all in, to uh, do a first initial cut and then tweak it on later is to me the best approach from both the maintainer point of view as the uh, contributed space point of view. I mean just think of what that message will send if more and more maintainers um, have a D8 version out. It may not be perfect yet um, but that will uh, create momentum and will send a message of hey D8 is really happening because don't forget without Contrib, D D8 core is nothing. D8 is not a website. So uh, D8 core may be the heart, but D8 Contrib is, um, is the lifeblood that we need to create real practical websites. So um, I was very disappointed, actually, that uh, one of the core members uh, of D8 even mentioned uh, as a comment to my blog, saying, everybody just, just relax, uh, don't do anything until uh, D8 beta comes out. Um, and I strongly disagree with that. Um, I've got the mountain to um, to move to change the um, the opinion on that, but I think it's slowly happening. There there are some people that uh, already have D8 sites out and and tell on their sites about the their, their experience with D8, and and that's just fantastic to have these trailblazers and and spearheaders in the community because there's already a lot to like and a lot uh, that you can use in D8, and uh, we just need to build on that collectively. Sitting back has never accelerated anything. I like the point that you made, and this is new to me, but it makes great <laughs> sense. Um, the point that you make that if you start upgrading your modules now, you've got a really great chance to practice the new coding standards and figure out how to call methods and use plugins and so on. Um, and even if everything is not completely stable in core, Tim Plunkett did make the point in a conversation uh, I had with him a couple of a few weeks ago. Um, he was saying actually it's incredibly helpful for the core maintainers as well if people are actively working in the contrib space because that's the best way to find bugs uh, in core and the best way to recognize opportunities for better optimization and so on. So actually, it uh, it's a, it's a bigger win than I realized. Oh, I was going to say one of the things that you know because we were just at Bad Camp with so many community members and there's there's intrepidation and, uh, and fear and the concern that I was an expert over here on 7 and I'm going to be a miserable newbie over there on 8. And there's no better way to get over that and to embrace it than to just try and fail and try and succeed um, now. And, and I think that the more we encourage the community to pick up the tools and try it, the, the greater that adoption rate, and, and then there'll be the clamor, like, why isn't it out yet? Get it out now. And that, and that will be good for Drupal um, as a whole. I don't know yeah. offhand anyone who really learned Drupal without just trying and failing and copying and pasting and implementing and, and refactoring. Exactly. And, um, I'm not sure exactly. where the idea that now it's just got you've just got to be able to you know open this book and it's somehow there for you already. I, that's 
that's a, a, a new idea we're encountering in this release cycle, and I, I'm not really sure where it came from. Well, I think all of us have been in Drupal long enough that we might have been around when there were no books. I remember when the first uh, professional Drupal book was published, and I'm sure you two remember that. Yeah. Um, so the only way everyone learned was breaking things and looking at core code and just trying it out and seeing what worked. Um, it was very frustrating. I like having books more, um, but there were there was no guide. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to talk with me, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all soon somewhere. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Rick. Great work. And, right. You know, generally. So that's, let's name check that. That is. Uh, Triplemodules.com. No, okay. top shelf. Or, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, is, is, that. that is top shelf modules. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Ryan, you're fired. Uh